Hello. Today we will be talking about stellar associations, star clusters, and binary stars. As we learned in the previous lecture, stars are born from giant molecular clouds, which collapse and form protostars and planets. One giant molecular cloud can form hundreds of stars, so that when stars are first born, they usually have a lot of neighbors. Each tile in this image shows one of these small star clusters made of hundreds of stars that all formed from the same parent cloud. Some of these giant molecular clouds are so giant that they can form really large clusters with thousands of stars, as in this picture of cluster NGC 3603. This cluster has thousands of stars that formed just a few million years ago and still surrounded by gas and dust from the parent cloud. That cloud is being illuminated here by the young stars, and the cloud will eventually dissipate completely due to that radiation pressure. What happens to the stars in these clusters? Well, almost all of the open clusters we observe are very young, less than a few hundred million years old. How do we know this? We know because they are filled with big and bright massive O, B, and A stars, which have very short lifetimes. For example, a cluster with main sequence O stars cannot be older than about 6 million years, because O stars have very short lifetimes, less than 6 million years in length. So, if the stars have short lifetimes, the clusters must be young. New star clusters form all the time, and they have been forming throughout the lifetime of the galaxy, but we don't see any old ones, so they can't last very long. Open star clusters are small, and that means that they're not very massive, and therefore they can be easily disrupted by gravitational interactions. Gravitational interactions with surrounding material mean that the stars in the cluster dis disperse. The lower mass the cluster is, the more vulnerable it will be to outside forces. Gravitational tidal forces from other stars and clouds in the galaxy will tear the groups apart. For that reason, larger groups tend to remain together for longer periods of time, and in fact the oldest open groups we know of, with stately ages of a few billion years, are among the most massive open clusters we know. I'd like to take a brief detour here to tell you about another type of cluster, a globular cluster, like the one we saw in our star party, M3. Globular clusters are very old objects, usually over 10 billion years old, and some almost as old as the universe itself. They last much longer than open clusters because they are much more massive. Instead of a hundred to a thousand stars, they can have hundred thousand to a million stars in a very small volume. In fact, I can zoom into the center of this, cluster, of this globular cluster to its core, and you'll see just how concentrated things can get. So their masses and concentrations are very high, which means that they have, they're much more resistant to tidal distortions. Because of their advanced ages, all massive stars in the cluster have moved off the main sequence and died, so they are essentially stellar graveyards, littered with hundreds of thousands of remnants. The stars left are very small stars, smaller than the sun, and a few red giants in the final throes of existence. Globular clusters are somewhat mysterious objects. Astronomers are still trying to figure out exactly how they form. We'll talk more about them in future classes. But the main differences here between globular clusters and open clusters, to recap, is that globular clusters have, are much higher mass. They have almost a million stars in them, and they're much older, whereas open clusters tend to have low masses, fewer stars in them, and tend to be much younger, so that the stars in them are much younger and also can be more massive and hotter. But back to our open star clusters. After a few million years, their clouds surrounding them dissipates, and the stars are torn apart by gravitational tides, each star flung out on its own into space. Most, or maybe even all stars, we still don't know for sure, are formed in groups like these. So our Sun was almost certainly once part of a group like this one. 
before it got ejected or stripped out of the group by some gravitational interaction and started its somewhat lonely journey throughout the galaxy. Now, a few years ago, I would say 85% of all stars in the galaxy are in multiple systems. But this is still an active area of research, and in fact, lots of different pieces of evidence are coming together that show us that we don't quite know ex what the fraction of binary star systems in our galaxy is. We know that um, the fraction of stars in binary systems must depend uh, on the masses of the stars. And so for big and bright stars, most of them are actually found in multiple star systems, binaries or, or um, trios of stars. But um, for lower mass stars, it seems like they actually tend to be more solitary, so they tend to exist in uh, single um, systems. But this is still a very active area of research. In any case, for stars more massive than the Sun, so O, B, A, F, and G stars, it seems that most stars, or a large percentage of them, are not actually lonely wanderers of the cosmos like our Sun, but rather live in binary or multiple systems. If you remember from our solar neighborhood model, only 15 of the stars were in single systems, whereas 23 of them live in systems with two, sometimes three stars. Stars in multiple systems can have many different configurations. Two stars might be in very close orbits, orbiting around each other in a few days or even hours. In this case, stars are very far apart, but in some cases, stars can be really close together. In systems with close pairs of stars like this, planets can still exist in large orbits surrounding both stars. Planets like Tatooine from Star Wars are likely to exist and may in fact be strong candidates for developing life. Stars that are further apart make stable planetary orbits more difficult, so it can be hard to hold on to these planets, and, can be, and it can be especially hard to have them in an orbit that has consistent conditions for life. In the classes in this module, we've talked about how astronomers measure some very fundamental properties of stars. We measure distances to stars using parallax. We can measure the intrinsic luminosity of a star, its energy output, by measuring brightness and distance, for example, and solving for the luminosity. We can measure temperatures by looking for the thermal emission peak and seeing what color the star is, or by identifying um, the strength and the existence of certain absorption lines in their spectrum, so by using spectroscopic classification. We use luminosity and temperature to deduce the sizes of stars, to infer those sizes based on the Stefan Boltzmann law. But we haven't talked about how we might actually measure stellar sizes. We haven't done so directly yet. We also have a certain expectation that more luminous main sequence stars are more massive. We think this is the case because their higher masses means that their temperatures and densities in the cores are higher, which leads to more nuclear fusion reactions, which leads to higher luminosity. And we've talked about this in previous classes, but we haven't actually talked about how we might measure the masses of stars. How can we do this? How can we measure directly mass and size of stars? The answer is in binaries. When two stars orbit each other, their motions are governed by gravity. This means that by observing how fast they move, we can deduce the amount of gravitational force they must be subject, subject to, and we can therefore deduce the mass of the two stars. As, as a star orbits another star, we see it move through a circular or elliptical orbit. So there must be a force keeping it on this orbit. That force is gravity. The strength of that force will be dependent on the mass of the two stars divided by the uh, distance between them squared. And that force is what's making the star accelerate in its orbit. That's told to us by 
uh, Newton's second law, F equals mass times acceleration. What does an orbit of a binary system look like? You might find that hard to visualize. We are used to thinking of planetary orbits, where the satellite is much less massive than the central object. But what happens when you increase the mass of the satellite until it's comparable to the central one? It actually might help to think about what happens in our own solar system. Jupiter has more mass than all the other planets combined. So we'll, we'll ignore all the others for now and think about the Sun-Jupiter system. Jupiter orbits the Sun in a nice, almost circular orbit. Under the force from the Sun, F equals g, the gravitational constant, times the mass of Jupiter, times the mass of the Sun, divided by their distance squared. That force produces the acceleration that keeps Jupiter in its circular orbit. But of course, as we know from class, if the Sun is exerting a force on Jupiter, Jupiter must be also exerting a force on the Sun. That force is of equal magnitude, it's just F equals mass of the Jupiter times mass of the Sun divided by the distance squared. But because the Sun is so massive, it results in a much smaller acceleration. The acceleration is there, though. The Sun makes really tiny wobbles back and forth because of the force from Jupiter. The wobbles are so small that they are less than the Sun's diameter in size. Even at these small scales with recent increases in technology, these wobbles are detectable at greater and greater distances, and it is this technique that has enabled us to discover hundreds of exoplanets around other stars. You'll find out more about this in your exoplanets lab. You can see that the star, even though the sun is wobbling, it's in fact orbiting around a point, the same point that Jupiter is orbiting around. This will become more obvious when we increase the relative mass of Jupiter versus the sun and we look at the orbit of this system now. So by increasing the mass of Jupiter, the wobble of the Sun keeps increasing so that its orbital radius becomes larger and larger. It's worth noting that even in these cases, Kepler's laws still apply. Each star is moving in an elliptical, or in this case, almost circular orbit, but now instead of the other star at the focus, the stars appear to orbit an empty point in space. That point is called the center of mass of the system. And it's equivalent to the fulcrum point on a scale, the midpoint between the two masses where their weights would be balanced. Notice that at any point in time, the two stars are always on the opposite sides in their orbits from the center of mass. Otherwise, of course, that point would no longer be the center of mass. As before, the largest mass moves the least and has the smallest orbit with the smallest speed. The smallest mass has the largest orbit and the largest velocity. Both stars have the same orbital period. But the more massive star has a smaller orbit than the less massive why is this? Again, this is a consequence of Newton's fundamental laws of motion. The force that's keeping these stars orbiting each other is the force of gravity. That force is the same for both of the stars. But because the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration, if you apply the same force to a more massive star, its acceleration is going to be less. So the more massive star moves less and accelerates less than the least massive star because the same magnitude of force is applied in both cases. Even though many stars are double, the resolution of even our best telescopes in space can often not distinguish the two stars from each other, 
In other words, they appear as one single point of light through the telescope. But spectroscopy comes to the rescue once more. By dispersing the combined light from both stars into a spectrum, we can often observe two sets of spectral lines, one for each star, and they each separately do a peculiar dance. As one star moves toward us, the other is always moving away, so that as one star's lines become blue-shifted, the other is becoming red-shifted, and the, the two lines just sort of exchange back and forth between them. You'll notice that when the stars are, when the uh, orange star is the closest to the observer, which is the little green dot, the um, both both lines are on top of each other, and that's because at that position, where the red star is at the closest position to the observer, and the blue star is at its farthest position to the observer none of those stars, neither of those stars, have any radial velocity. Their velocity is all transverse in a perpendicular plane to the direction towards the observer. So neither of the stars are uh, Doppler shifted. So by looking at the Doppler shifts in the spectral lines of each star, we can see how their radial velocity changes along the orbit. And we can plot those radial velocity curves. Like these plots here, each panel corresponds to a different binary system. And again, by looking at which of the stars um, is moving at the higher velocity, so the one that reaches the highest velocity peaks, that's the star that's going to be the least massive because, again, it's the same force that's acting on both stars, but the least massive one is going to accelerate more, so it's going to have a higher radial velocity. And that's the way that we can assign mass between the two different um, stars. Sometimes the, sometimes the mass, sometimes the stellar companion is so small and faint, for example in the case of a white dwarf, that it can be hard to identify in the spectrum. In those cases we only see the spectral lines for one star moving back and forth, but the motion tells us that there must be something applying a gravitational tug, a faint star like a white dwarf, or sometimes even a planet. These invisible companions leave their telltale signs in the wobbles or the radial velocity curves of the stars. This is the radial velocity curve for the star Pollux, which you guys should by now, uh, you know, know and love well in the star in the uh, April night sky. That's where um, Castor and Pollux are the two brightest stars in the constellation of Gemini, where Jupiter has been the last few months, and that star Pollux actually has a planet orbiting around it. That planet is invisible by most other means, but it does induce this little wobble in the radial velocity so that we can deduce its existence by looking at how that star's light becomes red-shifted and blue-shifted with time. So, Binary systems that are identified through shifts in their spectroscopic lines are called spectroscopic binaries. The faster the stars are orbiting around one another, the more massive the system must be. So if we can measure the speeds of both stars, we can determine how much of the mass is in each star. And using this technique, we've determined masses for thousands of stars. If we now look at the mass, luminos and luminosity of stars on the main sequence, we can measure the mass-luminosity relation for main sequence stars. And this is what it looks like if you plot the luminosity, the measured luminosity, versus the measured mass for a sample of stars on the main sequence. There's a very tight correlation between those two. And the line that we fit through this data is equivalent to the luminosity depending on the mass to the power of 3.5. So again, we see that our intuition was correct. 
more luminous stars are in fact more massive. And because of this high power of mass, it actually means that a small difference in mass leads to a very big increase in luminosity. There's a very special case of binary star systems called eclipsing binaries. These are systems where the orbital plane is inclined just so, so that we see one star eclipse the other. These systems allow not only the relative luminosities and masses to be constrained, but also the sizes of each star. And we'll find more about the systems in the lecture tutorial, and you'll also be seeing them again in your exoplanets lab. In eclipsing binary stars, one star passes in front of the other star from the perspective of us here on Earth. And if you think about it, when the two stars are separate, that's when you're getting, going to get the most amount of light from the combined system of the two stars. When one star blocks light from the other star, the combined light must go down. At some point, the first star will orbit all the way around and go behind the other star, and then you have a secondary eclipse. So eclipsing binary stars go through two eclipses, one of the primary and the other of the secondary. The relative, um, the relative degrees of eclipse, so how much brightness, how much the brightness goes down at each of these eclipses tells you what the relative uh, brightness of the two stars is, and it can also, the um, the shape of the curve during eclipse can tell you something about the sizes of the stars, but again, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the lecture tutorial. Finally, binary stars can sometimes get too close, and they can start directly interacting with each other. Gas from one's atmosphere can be pulled onto the other one, for example, in what we call an episode of mass transfer. This happens often when a big puffy star like a red giant orbits a close by star. The material at the surface of the star is so far from the core that the gravity there is weak and it can easily be pulled off by a nearby orbiting massive object. Things get even more interesting when stars orbit very dense compact objects like white dwarfs or neutron stars or even black holes too closely. In that case, material can get ripped off the donor star and accreted onto the compact object. Because the gravity field close to the compact object is so intense, the stripped material accelerates to very high speeds and forms an accretion disk around the compact object. This gas is moving so fast and is at such high temperatures that it emits in the X-ray regime, giving rise to a system called an X-ray binary. The stuff emitting the X-rays in the gas is the gas being accreted onto the black hole or neutron star. When mass is accreted onto a white dwarf, the gas heats up and nuclear fusion can occur in a thin shell surrounding the dwarf. We get a nova. A nova is a short burst of luminosity from what we thought was a previously dead star. So again, we have a white dwarf it's a remnant star, it hasn't done much in many, many years. And all of a sudden, this new material, this new influx of material is deposited onto the surface of the star. That material gets really hot really quickly, and it goes through this period of runaway nuclear fusion. That releases a lot of energy, and we get a nova. Once that stuff is burnt through, you just get a white dwarf again. So it's just one period of a burst of luminosity before we get back to the regular white dwarf remnant. But what if the accreted mass pushes the white dwarf above the Chandrasekhar limit? Remember that Chandrasekhar limit is the limit is 1.4 solar masses, and that's the highest mass that can be held apart by electron degeneracy pressure. So Anything higher than that mass and the force from gravity is just too high and so the electrons, the degeneracy pressure amongst the electrons is just not strong enough to keep this, to hold the star apart. So what if in one of these periods of mass transfer you accrete more mass than the white dwarf can hold? Well in that case, 
electron degeneracy pressure is no longer strong enough to support the star and the star collapses. It heats up and starts a thermonuclear runaway process where the entire star will burn up and explode in under 10 seconds. And that's what's called a supernova type 1a. These supernova are different than supernova type 2, which is the type that we already talked about that is formed when a big massive star collapses at the end of its life. A supernova type 1a is, we believe, the result of mass accretion onto a white dwarf that's close to that Chandrasekhar limit. Because the explosion happens always at that same mass limit, 1.4 solar masses, the luminosity curves of type 1a supernovas are really easy to predict. They have a very characteristic shape. And based on that characteristic shape, we can actually deduce how intrinsically luminous the, the supernova must be. And remember now back to your brightness-luminosity relationship. If we know how intrinsically luminous something must be and we measure its brightness, then we can deduce exactly how far away something is. And that's very powerful because it means that we can use these very, very bright supernova. Remember, supernova when they blow up can be as bright as an entire galaxy put together, like in this real image of a nearby galaxy where a supernova along its outskirts blew up. And you can see that the supernova is almost as bright as the entire galaxy. Because supernovas are so bright, we can see them really far away. And if we know how intrinsically luminous they are, then we can use them as essentially measuring sticks. We can measure distances in the universe using supernova very accurately. And in fact, it's supernova type 1a that have told us that the universe is not only expanding, but it's accelerating in its expansion due to the presence of this mysterious dark energy. And that'll be the topic of another class. In summary, most, if not all, stars are born in open clusters, groups of 10 to 1,000 stars that are all formed from one giant molecular cloud. These associations are easily disturbed by gravitational interactions, and therefore open clusters are very short-lived, usually less than a few hundred million years. We know this because all the open clusters we see are extremely young and have very big and bright and massive O stars in them. Globular clusters are very different from open clusters. They're much more massive and they're very old. All the massive stars in them have died and they're filled with stellar remnants. We also learned that a large percentage of all stars in the galaxy are in multiple systems. Stars in a binary system will orbit the common center of mass. We can detect binaries even if we can't visually uh, resolve the two components by looking for Doppler shifts in their absorption line spectra. We can deduce each star's mass based on how fast they are orbiting each other. And if the orientation of the binary is just right, we can actually see stars eclipse one another and thereby deduce their relative brightnesses and sizes. When stars get too close to each other, mass transfer can occur between the two stars. When the mass deposited onto a white dwarf makes it exceed its Chandrasekhar limit of 1.4 solar masses, electron degeneracy pressure is no longer strong enough to hold the star apart. The white dwarf completely disintegrates and explodes as a supernova type 1a.